Hello, I'm Aminta Dawson with the ACES staff. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Natural History Data Curation, Maintaining Infrastructures and Turning Documents into Data Sets, sponsored by the GCMI Education Committee. Our distinguished presenter is Dr. Andrea Thomer, who will be introduced by our moderator, Dr. Karen Wickett, who is an assistant professor in the School of Information Sciences at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and leads webinar organization for the DCMI Education Committee. I'd like to ask the audience to type your questions into the question panel box and they'll be answered at the end of the presentation. I will now turn this session over to Dr. Karen Wickett, who will introduce our presenter. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Andrea Thomer is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. She conducts interdisciplinary research on scientific data curation and on the maintenance and evolution of knowledge infrastructures. She's especially interested in database curation, integrative data reuse, and the collaborative use and curation of natural science data. Dr. Thomer earned her doctorate at the School of Information at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2017. Prior to her graduate work, she was an excavator and ad hoc data curator at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, California. Take it away, Andrea. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I just want to start by thanking you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be talking about a portion of my work that uh, it, it's been one of the major portions of my work for not just um, since I've become an information scientist, but um, really been a driving interest in my career. Um, which is um, natural history data curation. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about me just to give you a little bit of introduction to who I am and how I come to this work. Um, and then I'm going to go over uh, a conceptual framing for this um, for, for this talk. Um, notably that I want to talk about natural history museum collections as knowledge infrastructures and I'll unpack some key concepts um, around that idea. I'm then going to present two studies of data curation in natural history museums, um, both of which are ongoing projects of mine. Um, and I'm really excited about sharing these with everybody and potentially recruiting people um, to participate in these projects as they go forward. Um, so just to say, I'm going to try to keep this very brief. Um, uh, so my name is Dr. Andrea Thomer. Um, I, um, wanted to tell you a little bit about myself because I come to information science um, from a slightly unusual sort of pathway. Um, while I was in community college um, way back in like 2005, I started volunteering at the La Brea Tar Pits, which is this massive fossil deposit in the middle of Los Angeles, um, where I dug out fossils, um, saber tooth cats, dire wolves, cool stuff like that. Um, so this is a picture of me here measuring out a North American lion skull that we eventually named Fluffy. Um, and by measuring out, I mean recording where the fossil was found in my field notes and um, writing that information down um, so that it can be preserved in perpetuity. Um, the thing that kicked me off to grad school, though, and um, isn't necessarily the fossils, it's more this computer right here um, with the blue screen, which is what my boss was using at the time <laughs> to maintain all of our field data uh, about that, um, about the excavation. And so this computer here, that the computer that sent me to grad school, this is going to come back in the talk a little bit, so I wanted to make sure to point it out. Um, while I was at La Brea, I got really interested in um, supporting our infrastructure and thinking about data curation in the context of natural history museums. And that's what I've continued to work on since then, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so starting off with our framing, um, I want to talk through what natural history museums are, for those of you that might not be as familiar with them as um, sources of data and uh, as knowledge infrastructures. And I also want to unpack three key concepts that are guiding my work and framing this talk. Um, so the first one is knowledge infrastructures. The second concept is materiality. And the third concept is data curation. Um, so to start off, um, I want to talk a little bit about natural history museums, what those are and what kind of work they do. Often when people think of natural history museums, their minds very understandably go to the exhibits um, to that they, they saw on grade school field trips. So big dinosaur skeletons in grand halls, um, taxidermied animals, things like that. But the aspect of natural history museums that I'm talking about today and that I focus my work on 
um, is the stuff that's kind of behind the scenes. It's the collections. Um, when I think about natural history museums, I think about the massive amounts of data that they contain, the millions of fossils, shells, fish in jars, taxidermied skins, and uh, things like that. These make up a giant database about our planet. Each one of these specimens is associated with a host of other data, like field notes, ecological survey data, genomic data, and much more. And each one represents an occurrence of an organism at a particular place at a particular time. So this heat map in the lower right-hand corner is a visualization of a bunch of occurrence records um, from GBIF, which is a large natural history data aggregator. Um, and it's showing where um, all of these different records of natural history specimens were collected all over the planet. So you see that we have this massive amount of data. You also see that it's a bit of a skewed um, system, the uh, a skewed col uh, data collection um, so far. Like there's a lot of activity in um, the, the Western world and less data collected from other parts of the world, which unfortunately also the other parts of the world that contain a lot of the biodiversity that we need to be studying with these collections. So there's a lot of work to be done continuing to fill out this data set. Um, these collections are um, incredibly important for a broad range of studies. So one place that I regularly see um, popular science articles about is of like uh, new species discovered in collections. So people looking at um, specimens that were collected decades to hundreds of years ago and realizing that these represent a new species that we weren't aware of. But beyond that, um, the collections data are used for um, all sorts of biodiversity studies. So looking at um, how different populations of animals are changing over time, how different biomes and ecologies are changing over time. Um, but more recently, there's been a lot of talk around using a lot of talk and a lot of research of um, using um, natural history collections um, to uh, show how pandemics start, um, to study viruses and other vectors and things that have major um, impacts on um, uh, the human life and, and agriculture and things like that. Um, so this is a recent paper uh, uh, um, uh, article out of the Telegraph um, talking about how we could actually be using natural history collections to get a better sense of um, where pandemics like the one that we are currently in um, start. So this is a massively important knowledge infrastructure. It's a massively important source of data for a lot of different topics. Um, so this brings us to key concept one. Um, I wanna take a moment to just define what I mean by knowledge infrastructures. Um, so by knowledge infrastructure, I mean the robust networks of people, artifacts, and institutions that generate, share, and maintain specific knowledge about the human and natural worlds. Um, I'm taking this definition from Paul Edwards' quite famous and quite excellent book, A Vast Machine, um, in which he talks about the knowledge infrastructure that is um, the global climate modeling community and all of the people, technology, and data that go into making climate science possible. Um, natural history museums and their data, these are another type of knowledge infrastructure. And I want to use that term because I think it um, helps call into attention that neither part of the, the network of, of these natural history museum collections functions alone. It's not just the specimens, it's not just the people, it's not just the institutions, but they all need to work together and, and the purpose is to produce knowledge. So the way in which natural history museums functions as knowledge infrastructures, um, so the people, um, I'm going to be primarily talking about the role that collections managers play in this work, but also volunteers, because um, they're actually a really critical uh, part to um, keeping museums functioning. Um, as far as artifacts, I've talked a little bit about this, but the, um, so Edwards talks about artifacts as being um, critical to knowledge infrastructures. Here, we can mean that quite um, literally. So it's all of the specimens that are um, captured and, and um, stored within the um, natural history collections worldwide. We do not have a, we are, there's, there's still not a sure estimate of how many specimens there are in these collections because not all of them are cataloged, um, but there have been some statistical analyses trying to estimate the number of specimens worldwide that put it around one to two billion. Um, beyond that, all of these um, specimens have a wealth of associated data with them. So there have been a lot of recent work um, trying to push to think about not just the physical object, but the extended specimen or the extended digital specimen 
uh, meaning the specimen as well as all of its digital data as a research object that needs to be curated and studied. The institutions that are part of this knowledge infrastructure, there are over 900 natural history museums worldwide, but there are also numerous um, other kinds of repositories um, in all sorts of counties, states, countries, and things like that. I'm mostly going to be talking about natural history museum collections, but I will talk, uh, one, one of the projects we're talking, we're using data from a, um, a, a, a uh, it's the Institute for Fisheries Research Repository, so it's a Department of Natural Resources. Um, so it's a, just a different kind of repository. And finally, the network holding all of this stuff together. Um, within these over 900 natural history museums, there are a bunch of local and networked database projects that are keeping them running. Um, some of these might be familiar to folks in the audience. Um, there are a many of these are, so this is a bunch of logos um, representing different um, data aggregation projects and um, different kind of data science projects within the Natural History Museum uh, community. I've organized these from left to right, kind of representing geology over to biology. So um, the IGSN effort it, um, stands for International Geosamples Numbering System. It's a push, it's basically DOIs for physical earth samples. Um, all the way over to the right, there's the Global Biodiversity Information Facility that I mentioned earlier, um, which harvests occurrence records from um, museums worldwide. Um, all of these projects together have been decades in the making. Natural history museums were actually very early adopters of um, computer technology, of databases, and have been leading the way for um, creating their own data sharing protocols um, in the style of OAI PMH, but customized for um, the natural history community. Um, and a, a wealth of grant funding um, has gone into supporting these networks, building these networks and trying to make them as fit for use as possible for different biological communities. However, <laughs> underlying that network um, is an infrastructure that is a little bit at risk. And, um, and this is, um, been the focus of a lot of my work. And this will be what I'm talking about. So this is taking me back also to the computer that sent me to grad school. Um, while there has been a ton of funding to support these aggregation projects, um, and, and, and I say a ton of funding, but there probably could be more, of course, but um, there's been a good amount of funding for these aggregation projects and these networking projects. There has been very little pro uh, funding um, supporting the computers and um, the infrastructures and the archives that are actually storing and archiving the data that is getting pushed to those aggregation projects. Um, so this computer, um, this picture is from 2008. Um, it is storing about, I'd say probably 40 years of field notes, um, field data in here that my boss had been um, typing and transcribing from the paper field notes pictured at the right by hand. Um, and he kept using it in 2008 because First of all, he really liked WordPerfect 3.1, and that is what this picture is of. Um, that was just his preferred mode of working. But the other reason that he kept using it is that he just never had a better option. Um, this was what worked for him. The, the Libre Tarpets has a really unique data structure, and even though there have been some really impressive and notable projects um, trying to build databases for local natural history museums, they just didn't work with the Libre data. Um, so he kept working with the infrastructure that he made, and kept, kept going as best he could. Um, but without further support, it was kind of stuck here until um, we started trying to pull the data off. It's no longer on this computer and getting it into a more preservation friendly format. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this, but um, I eventually found that this was not a unique situation and then there are other sorts of infrastructures like this that are at risk. Um, Anyway, so this is bringing us also to key concept number two, which is data curation. Um, I wanted to make sure to define data curation for those that are not as familiar with this, um, this kind of area within the information sciences. Um, so I, the, the definition that I kind of grew up with in grad school is that data curation is the active and ongoing management of data through its life cycle of interest and usefulness to scholarship, science, and education. Um, I have lately started trying to summarize that in a slightly shorter way and thinking of it as the work of making a data set fit for purpose, shareable, and archive ready. Um, it's what you do to data in order to um, make it usable and stable. Um, 
Data curation has been a huge part of information science scholarship um, over the last couple of decades because it's an increasingly important job for information professionals in a wide range of settings. Um, here, I want to I'm talking about it because it's a core but under-recognized activity in natural history collections work. Um, it's something that I've found is just going on in the background with um, natural history museums, but it's often not called out explicitly and um, not specifically supported. There's not really a data curation position in a lot of these um, organizations. Um, natural history museums have some really unique data curation challenges that overlap with just their physical <laughs> curation challenges. Um, so first of all, their data is just massively heterogeneous. Um, I talked about this a little bit already, but there's a huge range of just physical things uh, in there, ranging from fossils to rocks and lichens to fish in jars and so on, um, which need their own kind of care and have their own uniquely structured records. Um, but they also have data in many different kinds of formats from paper to digital. Um, when I was working at La Brea, um, there is one little exhibit um, that I, I unfortunately don't have a picture of. Um, including the punch cards that our collection was originally databased on. So there's a really wide range of historical formats all over the place. Um, the data is notoriously messy, um, partially because there's just not a, there's not enough people in these, um, they're, they're understaffed and so they can't update records. And it's also because taxonomy and scientific research kind of functions in a parallel line and there's not enough crosstalk between the museums and the researchers. And finally, um, the collections are really old. Um, so the collections themselves are often decades, if not centuries old, describing items that are sometimes millions of years old. And as I just showed, they're often in platforms or in formats that are older than they ideally should be. Um, so this brings us to our last key concept before I get into talking about um, the two projects that I'm presenting, um, which is the, the, this idea of materiality. So um, I'm bringing this in as a way to talk about a couple of the different um, data curation obstacles um, that uh, natural history museums uh, are facing. So um, materiality is the form that digital objects um, as well as, sorry, excuse me. So Paul Dourish wrote this, wrote about materiality in his book, um, The Stuff of Bits, um, where he defined materiality as the form of digital objects as well as the consequences of that form. Um, specifically, he talks about the materiality of information representation and how the forms of information impact the function of an information system. Um, I've been doing some research into um, how the materialities of representing information wind up shaping curatorial systems. Um, so with Karen Wickett, the moderator of this webinar, um, we did a small study of how the um, materialities of databases wind up impacting the work that you wind up doing with them. And um, our finding was that the materialities of representing information like relational databases wind up becoming communication regimes in their own right that perpetuate beyond the database. So in other words, once you start using database-like structures, you and your entire community are more and more likely to use database-like structures, even when it's not um, an ideal uh, sort of match to that particular um, situation. So I'm bringing in this kind of esoteric concept because um, I found that it's a really good way of summing up a lot of the obstacles to curation and data curation in natural history museums, um, both in a very literal sense in that there's a lot of like physical matter that these folks need to, to work with, and in a digital sense because the natural history museums have this enormous technical debt of um, just systems and legacy formats, um, things that are in older formats that need to be moved forward into newer formats um, and and that, that migration is a massive challenge. Um, so I'm gonna talk more about this physical materiality in my first case study, and then getting into this more abstract kind of materiality in the second case study. Um, so this takes us to, okay, I'm gonna start with my, my first case study here, um, talking about cha the changes project. Um, and this is the turning documents into data sets aspect of the talk. Um, so, um, before I showed this picture here of the La Brea field notes um, in our fireproof safe um, back in Los Angeles, um, there are thousands, millions maybe, of other archives just like that. Um, it's unclear because um, there just really haven't been any formal surveys of them. And as folks in archives know, um, there tend to be just many, many hidden collections in, in all sorts of memory institutions and organizations. Um, these data are potentially 
incredibly important. Um, they're often incredibly rich, but um, they are often in formats that are just too hard to work with. Um, it's incredibly time consuming to scan and transcribe all of this information. And like I said before, there doesn't tend to be a ton of funding in order to support this sort of work. Um, so one example of one of these data archives, and so we're pivoting away from La Brea at this point, um, I've been working with collaborators at the School for um, Environment and Sustainability here at UM, as well as in the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology um, to tackle a large dig dig digitization project um, with historical data records from the Institute for Fisheries Research. Um, so the IFR here has been doing surveys of Michigan lakes since the late 1890s. Um, and my survey, so this picture in the upper left-hand corner is showing one of these surveys in action. It means going to lakes and counting fish or counting different kinds of vegetation or taking down notes about the ecology in a structured sort of way. Um, and the survey data would be collected on these large index cards that I have pictured here. So um, there's three different types of cards. I'm not gonna go into what each of these are in detail. I mostly just wanted to point out that there are multiple types of cards. Um, I only have three here, but there's closer to maybe two dozen in this entire collection that we have of this over 100 years worth of um, field data. Um, these cards are stored in card catalogs, much like you would see in an older library or something like that. <clears throat> and until the last two years, they've been in a mostly analog paper-based format. Um, and this is the case for many, many other similar archives. Um, so in this case, we see two material obstacles to data curation. Um, so in a very, very literal sense, there's just a lot of paper to, to deal with here. Um, and and for I haven't introduced this project fully, but um, we're working on digitizing all these scar cards. Um, and I just want to send a special shout out to our undergrad research assistant, Kardik Tarwani, who uh, scanned about 15,000 of these cards at home during um, COVID lockdowns. Um, in this collection overall, um, we have over 75,000 cards scanned to date, um, and we're pretty sure that's almost all of them, representing over 6,000 lakes within Michigan. So that's the very physical materiality. Um, but in a more figurative sense, um, there's um, a, we're faced with the um, obstacles of materiality in um, trying to create efficient, reproducible, and generic workflows to transform the numbers on these um, index cards um, into a computable and archivable um, data set. Um, so that's where we turn to community science or sometimes called citizen science approaches. Um, so community science is the collection and analysis of data related, relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. So one um, great example of this is the Audubon Society's um, annual backyard bird count, where people basically are asked to count the birds in their backyard, and this helps scientists uh, understand migration patterns and changes in those over time. Um, there are a lot of online platform or digital platforms for this now. So one that I really like is Seek by iNaturalist, which uses, um, you basically can take pictures of plants and have them identified via Seek's machine learning algorithms. Um, and then uh, I should say that um, those observations become occurrence records and they're used by, can be used by scientists as well. Um, but the one, um, the approach that we're using is one that started off with this Galaxy Zoo project where um, uh, basically many, many um, photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope were uploaded um, to this platform and um, community scientists, volunteers from the internet were recruited to help classify um, um, the shapes of, uh, classify galaxies according to their shape. Um, this was an incredibly popular project, which launched um, maybe about 10 years ago, um, which led to over 70 different um, scientific publications with this data, and then led to the creation of what of Zooniverse, which is now this large platform for creating your own citizen science projects. Um, so that that is what we are doing <laughs> basically um, with the IFR data set. And I'm also working on a parallel project with some of the field notes from La Brea. So um, CHANGES stands for Collections, Heterogeneous Data, and Next Generation Ecological Study. Um, it's one of those acronyms that we wrangled to try to make a word and um, secretly also a reference to a David Bowie song. Um, 
So the changes University of Michigan team um, is Karen Alofs, Hernan Lopez Fernandez, Kevin Worley, Randy Singer, Justin Schell, and myself. And um, we are also working on a project with um, the La Brea field data with Ashley Farrell at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about the IFR project for the next um, couple minutes. So, um, okay, so this brings us to um, the, the actual citizen science workflow. Um, so now that we have these 76,000 cards scanned and sorted according to their type, um, we've created a workflow on this Zooniverse platform to recruit community science volunteers to help us transcribe these things. Um, our project is called Angling for Data on Michigan Fishes. Um, and I'm going to try to show this video here to kind of demonstrate the um, transcription process. Um, okay, so um, I showed that there were a couple of different types of cards. Um, the first thing that I just did was select one particular workflow for one particular card. Right now, I'm clicking through um, a little bit of tutorial. Um, I'm going to pause this while I'm talking. Maybe I can, hopefully. Okay, so what I just clicked through um, was a little bit of tutorial. So that's available for novice users who haven't worked with this kind of platform before. Um, and then once you um, get a little bit of training on that, you're taken to this interface to work through uh, the transcription of the cards. Um, so on the left, there's the actual card that needs to be transcribed. In this workflow, we're just asking folks to transcribe information about a, a particular fish called pumpkin seed. So we're not asking them to um, transcribe the entire card, just the bits of data that we know are going to be useful for later climate studies and understanding how um, the impacts of climate change has impacted like fish in these in these populations. So I'm going to press play again. So um, What's going on here is that uh, I, I wanted to show this as a demonstration of this very focused workflow that we've developed to help volunteers um, actually transcribe these cards. Um, it points them to the few bits of data that we really need them to collect. In this case, the number of fish, the length range, and the mean length, um, and uh, keeps them focused on, uh, on just that particular bit of information. Um, okay. Underlying this workflow, and I apologize if this is a little bit um, hard to see, um, all of these workflows were custom made for this project and Zooniverse allows you to do that just on your own. So basically, we don't have a special relationship with Zooniverse uh, aside from Justin Shell um, here at the Shapiro Design Lab, uh, who is really, really good at these projects and um, has a lot of collaborations there, but anyone can set up one of these projects and make it public um, using this workflow um, development interface. Um, I'm not going to go into all of this, but you can see here, these are all of the different steps that are part of that interface that we created um, and that we were able to put together in this way. Um, so Zooniverse is the workflow that we're using to transcribe all of this data. That's one aspect of getting um, the data from one material form into another. The other part of it, though, is really extensive data curation processes. Um, so we are um, we, we've made data dictionaries for basically every single card in the collection so that we can track what workflow we're using to collect information and what information is actually being um, collected. So here you can see that we have basic metadata about the cards being collected with one workflow, which we call the basic workflow. And then we get this information about the actual fish size in a different workflow. So it's split up in these different layers of, of projects. Um, our work now is really focusing on coming up with more um, repeatable data curation and integration recipes. So um, Zooniver getting the data transcribed is just one part of this work. Um, after it needs to be extensively processed, not just to clean it up so that we can see the data um, uh, nicely, but also so that we can get it in shape to use in the statistical sorts of analyses that um, in the modeling um, that we want to do to to really look at how um, the impact of climate change on these ecologies. Um, and our goal though, as part of this project is to create recipes using the, the verbiage of this program called um, Open Refine. Um, so we wanna create recipes that would be useful to other institutions doing similar work. Because we do know that there are thousands of other archives like this and probably thousands of other organizations that would like to do a, um, a, a, a similar sort of project. So we, we're, we're trying to make reproducible um, data curation sort of workflows. Um, part of that, um, and this is, uh, I'm hoping to get a paper written about this, but we're still working on it. 
One of the things that we're doing in support of making these reproducible workflows is trying to categorize our own curatorial actions that we're doing to this data in, in the process of cleaning it. Um, so this background is an example. Um, this is a screenshot of that program, Open Refine, which I know you guys had, a, there was a DCMI webinar on that a couple um, months ago. Um, and um, I've been doing a lot of like hand curation to this data to try to clean it up and get it ready for, for archiving. Um, I just want to point out that there are 650 edits to this spreadsheet so far. Um, but as we've been reflecting on our own work um, and reflecting on the kind of work that we're doing in Open Refine, we're coming up with these categories of curatorial actions. So for instance, um, one thing that we often have to do when um, approaching um, a, a data set like this is deciding whether capturing the verbatim text of a field is important or not. So that means do we need to capture what the volunteer typed in exactly, what was on the card exactly, or is that not actually important to our, our later um, um, analysis? Um, there, we also do a lot of reconciliation with different kinds of authority files. So, um, and so, and, and in biodiversity data that involves um, reconciliation with like authority lists for taxonomic names. Um, we also have authority lists for lakes and lake names and also people, data collectors. And then um, also a lot of reconciliation with one particular kind of data model. So getting basically crosswalking this legacy data into a format that is more archive ready and um, easier for, for um, analysis. Um, so we're also hoping to develop best practices for similar projects and um, planning on getting something published on that within the next um, six months, I'm hoping. Um, so the next step on this project. Um, so we're still in the process of getting this data curated um, and still in the process of getting it into our own archive and doing our own analysis. Um, but we are very aware that there are lots of other archives like this. Um, we the next step in, in that area is further knowledge infrastructuring and community building for this kind of work. Um, I think there's some easy, there's some low hanging fruit in terms of research questions around working with this kind of data um, around. So things like what common genres of curatorial actions are needed to make historical data fit for use? What are the technical systems needed to archive and share this data? And what are some of the ethical issues that arise when making this data more accessible? Um, so sometimes, um, I should also say privacy issues. So sometimes if it's an endangered animal, you don't wanna share um, that locality information and so on and so forth. So as we're going forward, we're hoping to do more community building in the form of workshops and, and things like that. The second step, and this is taking me to my, my other um, case study uh, or the other project that I'll be talking about is integrating all this data back into museum catalogs. Um, so, and this is where I'm gonna to pivot to talking back to La Brea a little bit more. Um, it's one thing to get the data. It's a whole other thing to um, get it into a already rigidly structured collections catalog um, uh, in, in a way that doesn't wind up breaking the database. Um, a lot of, much of the data that we're collecting is actually associated with specimens that are in natural history museums. And ideally we'd like to find some way of connecting the data archive records to the actual specimen records. However, the databases are just not designed for that. Um, additionally, um, I've brought this up here and I'll go through this again in a couple of slides, just to show that um, databasing in natural history museums isn't, it's, it's not as straightforward as you would necessarily hope. Um, databases aren't just databases, but they're also amalgamations of really important spreadsheets and, um, and, and spreadsheets that we hope will eventually get into the database, but so far, but often um, are just kind of out there on their own. So this brings me to the second study that I'm talking about, um, migrating and maintaining natural history museum infrastructures. Um, in this case, navigating figurative materiality. So that idea of the, um, the materiality of data structures and the roadblocks that it winds up causing as you're trying to maintain or migrate an infrastructure over time. Um, last time you'll see this, this, this computer, I promise. But um, so again, going back to the, my, my boss's computer from 2008, um, that his, his preferred infrastructure for um, maintaining and uh, updating records about our field notes. Um, so as I've done more work in natural history museums, I've found out that um, this is not in the least bit a unique situation. So maintaining this really old, very idiosyncratic system. Um, I kept visiting um, different museums and finding different versions of this computer. 
Um, this screenshot on the right, um, this isn't necessarily one that I saw uh, myself, but it's a tweet from my collaborator or colleague here at UM, Christopher Dick, um, <laughs> saying ARG, and on the note on the this very old tower PC saying, um, save copy of old fungus database on this machine. Um, I am showing all these pictures to try to illustrate that there are lots and lots of these these older legacy systems that are still around and that are um, kind of these these are infrastructures at risk. They're potential obstacles to the usability of this data, partially because they could just break at any moment. Um, and they are obstacles to the eventual migration of this data because the formats are so old that it's actually really hard to get the data off of these machines some, some, um, sometimes. So um, as I've seen more and more systems like this, um, I started wondering why are systems like this persisting? How are systems like this persisting? And what are the practices and tools that are needed to support migration and maintenance of these systems going forward? Um, so I, I wanna make sure to, to underscore that. I don't really see these as um, cases where people are doing something bad. I think most of the time people are working, so in data curation or in, in librarianship, often there can be a, an inclination to see someone doing something that's not a best practice and kind of want to scold them a little bit. What the folks maintaining these systems are doing is usually the best with, they're doing the best with the materials that they have and the resources that they have available to them. Um, so rather than seeing this as a case of, of just, um, you know, getting stuck in the past or something like that, I see it as a case of, of cleverness and of people being very creative and hardworking and making their jobs in, in maintaining their systems, even when they don't have the, the support that they need, either whether it's financial or staff support or, or just hardware or something like that. Um, so seeing many, many instances of this um, has led me to start trying to study database migration and maintenance more uh, in a more focused sort of way. Um, there's a big need for this in the information sciences. Um, there hasn't been a ton of work done in this area. Um, uh, partially, it's needed just because collections data lasts longer than databases. We are trying to curate. So anybody working in an information um, in a memory institution is trying to curate collections that last longer, that last generationally. Um, they should last longer than your career. They should last longer than just one system. And of course, that means they should last longer than very short-lived software on which that that we're using to store all of this data. Um, database migration is also expensive, time-consuming, and important work. And I have found that it's sometimes overlooked in favor of these larger projects around like data aggregation or, or more, more flashy sorts of data science-y sorts of things. Um, despite the commonness of this work, um, there are surprisingly few best practices I've found to actually guide people in database maintenance and migration, particularly within a memory institution context. Um, and I, yeah, there's just a general need for doing a little bit more of this research in um, the information sciences. Um, so I've been doing this work um, as part as, or, or trying to start this research on database migration and development of best practice or at least guidelines um, through an early career grant from the IMLS called Migrating Research Data Collections. Um, so in this grant, I, am, I and my students are looking at collections as databases um, in libraries, archives, museums, and, and um, different kinds of research institutions. Um, by collections as databases, I mean databases uh, like collections catalogs that are being treated as databases that are sometimes being used as research in their own um, research, uh, so research data in their own right. Um, so they're, they're um, catalogs that have um, functionality beyond just providing an index to things. Um, the method for this project is that we've been interviewing people at different libraries, archives, and museums um, involved in database migration so far. And I think we are definitely done with data collection at this point. We've interviewed about 70 people at um, 40 different libraries, archives, and museums. About 25 of them have been from natural history museums or are working with natural history museum data. Um, we're also reviewing database documentation when it's available. And the goal of these interviews is to ask, how has your database changed since you began working with it? And what have you done to maintain it? Um, our hope by doing this is that we can, first of all, identify common struggles in this work, common strategies um, for, for maintaining these systems, even when they don't have enough resources. Um, and uh, then also think about developing new tools or, or um, guidelines to help folks so that they don't have to keep reinventing these strategies um, 
uh, over and over again. Um, so a couple of findings from this project so far. Um, I mentioned this before, but the first thing we found is that um, the, the, and particularly within the Natural History Museum um, context, I'm mostly reporting the findings from, from that aspect of this project. Um, we found that for most uh, Natural History Museum collections um, have this idea of getting into just one database system, but in practice, um, there's more than one system going on. So again, this is um, a diagram showing the database developments at the La Brea Tar Pits, where I used to work. Um, and while they are currently using this KEEMU database, I think it's now called Axial, um, as their main collections catalog, and there is a hope that that will always be um, uh, that 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 will be the one database or one data system that they have to use. There are also other really important data systems that they use as the kind of these ad hoc um, catalogs. So things like Google Sheets for a particular kind of um, microfossil data, um, uh, radiocarbon data set stored in a separate file, and so on. Um, so most collections have more than one system that they're maintaining, even though they have this idealized version that they want to get to in their head of just one system. Um, we've also found that there are really just less than straightforward migrations in these um, uh, collections. So I'm going to go through one little database history just from one particularly extreme version or extreme case of a challenging database migration. So um, in this collection, we're calling it Prairie University with a paleo mineral collection. Um, it was originally a paper card catalog. It was digitized at some unknown point decades past, probably in the 80s. Um, so digitized and databased, I mean, um, then migrated to an access database um, at some point in the 90s. Um, and then uh, they tried to migrate the um, access database to a um, Natural History Museum specific database called Specify. Unfortunately, that didn't work because the um, paleo mineral collection schema was just too idiosyncratic. It was too different from the underlying database schema of Specify, and they just weren't able to create a crosswalk. This led to when, at the time of my interview with, with this collections manager, um, uh, they wound up having to store every single table of their very complex relational database as a separate Excel file to try to maintain that database in its structure while they were waiting for a um, Microsoft SQL server to be set up um, for them to actually migrate it to. Um, so I, I present this little example um, because this is just not how people, if, if you read books about database mi migration, this is just not how <laughs> they're supposed to go. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very wandering path to getting into a new system. Um, other findings, um, we found that collections managers um, at Natural History Museums, um, by and large, were also functioning as database curators. Um, and um, despite the fact that few of them had formal training in database design, use, or management, um, most of them learned things through workshops and were self-taught through books. Um, and we also started identifying some common problems. So most of these systems did not have any sort of documentation of their legacy systems. So all of these collection managers mostly had to reverse engineer the systems as they got into their new jobs and to figure out how to maintain them over time. Um, we found a lot of resource scarcity, which is not super surprising, um, but they just didn't have enough time to work on these systems. They didn't have enough people to help them with it. They just don't have enough money. Um, as far as um, more material concerns or more information science -y concerns, um, we found that there were some, one of, the, it's one of the biggest obstacles to migration was just schema mismatches between systems. A lot of the natural history collection databases are homegrown and very idiosyncratic. And as they try to get migrated to more community developed platforms with just one system, um, schema mismatch can be a really time consuming obstacle to that migration. Um, we also found that a lot of these systems wound up getting haunted by ghosts of database, uh, databases past. And this is a phrase from one of my participants, um, but it's referring to traces of prior structure and logical constraints that wind up haunting modern systems. Um, so basically, um, quirks from a older system that get, get translated and migrated into a newer system. Um, collections manager had some common and creative solutions for navigating these projects problems. Um, mostly in, um, they would do things like trying to make data fit into a database with a conflicting data model by co-opting fields, which I'll explain in just a moment. 
Um, they would do things like build their own query systems to um, using modern tools to query a uh, legacy system. So we talked to one person who used R to query an older Fox Pro database system, which was no longer supported. Um, and um, the last one I think I'll highlight here is that we, we found that they draw on a lot of craft practices to navigate the materialities of these systems. Um, Karen, am I good to go another three minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, I, so I, I, just, I wanted to unpack um, just a few, one of these ideas of this maintenance through adaptation sort of idea. Um, so uh, we found a bunch of people would do things like co-opting fields for new, different, new and different purposes. So, um, and by co-opting fields, I mean, it's uh, basically you have a schema that's set up to do one thing and you repurpose um, the, the attributes to store a, a kind of data that they're not supposed to store. This is, this is a very logical thing to do when you need to store data, but it creates long-term problems when you're eventually trying to migrate the data out of the, the system and creates long-term problems for um, data curation. Um, but this is also getting back to um, some of the obstacles that are created um, through like uh, because of information materiality. So your data is in a structure and um, you, most of the collections managers were not able to access and edit that structure in order to customize the database in, in the way that they needed it to get it to function. Um, I'm gonna, I know I'm short on time. Um, I, so I, I mentioned these craft practices as being central to database curation. I, I'm not gonna go into this, but I am gonna advertise an upcoming iConference poster that my student, Ali Rayburn and I have coming out. Um, and um, we've started to identify some common tools that we need um, and like standards to move data in and out of relation, relation, relational systems. So we need ways of navigating these information materialities um, so that people are getting less stuck. Um, okay. So to sum up, <laughs> natural history museums are important knowledge infrastructures and important sites of data curation. Um, the materiality of the data is a major obstacle to its curation, both physically and digitally. And um, in my future work, I'm hoping to build more tools and more theory around, um, you know, thinking through this work. Um, and I want to close just by thanking um, my changes colleagues, my PhD student, Ali Rayburn, and my funders for giving me money to, to work on these projects. I'm sorry I went a little bit over time, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, um, we really appreciate this talk. It's really fascinating stuff and you're doing a lot of work here. Um, so we have a bunch of questions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to since this is uh, sponsored by the DCMI meta, uh, Metadata Initiative, I'm going to kind of, uh, uh, I guess, favor metadata questions. Uh, and we'll see kind of where we get. Uh, if folks have other questions, um, I'm sure Andrea is uh, happy to have you reach out over email after uh, the webinar. Uh, so uh, I think here, let's get... Um, uh, Somebody asked a question. I'm trying to find it now. I'm oh, say, uh, so uh, A. Smith asked a question. Uh, can you further explain what schema mis mismatch means and give an example? Yeah, um, I, I should have unpacked that. I apologize for not doing that. So um, by schema mismatch, I'm referring to database schemas or um, database structures. So when you build a relational database, particularly, um, you um, separate data into different classes. Um, and uh, you also, and those classes all involve different attributes that are pre-typed, basically. Um, so maybe if you're familiar with metadata standards, it's like a metadata standard, but more so. <laughs> it's like uh, it's a little bit more complex because you're also articulating the relationships between the terms there. Um, and a very common thing that will happen is that um, your data will be in one schema. And, um, and so uh, if you were trying to crosswalk it to another one um, because it's in a newer system or it's a system that allows you to aggregate and share it a little bit more easily, um, sometimes there's not a one-to-one -one match between your older attribute, your older metadata term and the newer one that you're trying to, to work to. Um, so it's very similar to issues of metadata crosswalking um, where it's just 
um, people use words in different ways and um, trying to translate that can be really challenging. Um, I hope that answered that question. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from Patricia Moore that says, can you talk about how you are handling taxonomic changes and recategorization of species within the metadata? Yeah, um, so we have not tackled that quite yet. I think so for the changes project where we really do need to um, think about the, the, the kinds of stuff, the, the kinds of organisms that we're working with in order to study how they're changing over time, um, I, most of that data is recorded with common names, so it's not even with a taxonomic designation. And so, um, I, honestly, unfortunately, my question is, my answer is going to be that um, we have not figured that out yet. I think we're going to have to um, look at each of those, um, those, those species and think about um, if, those have, if there have been changes to their designations or, or, or uh, over time. Um, I do know that within, um, like the La Brea collections, most of the time the taxonomic names just wind up not getting updated, um, even if they're updated in the literature. Um, it, it just because um, I think the collections managers don't have a lot of time for that. So what winds up happening is that it gets done on a kind of a case by case basis. So like if a researcher comes in and works with the data, then the collections managers might update the name in the catalog. But unfortunately, we, do, we have not figured out, I think that's a huge area for future work. Um, and thinking about how to do that in a more systematic sort of way. Great. Uh, I have so, there's so many, I'm, these questions are fantastic too. So thanks to the audience for all these great questions. Um, so uh, here's a question from Jessica Chang. Uh, can you, could you share more about how you chose or create a most fit metadata standard like D Darwin Core or others for the natural history data you mentioned in your study? And how might they be interoperable or connected with other natural history data collected elsewhere using other metadata standards? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Darwin Core, it gets used by aggregators like GBIF um, or, or like VertNet or something like that. Um, and that's because um, Darwin Core is really good at describing that kind of the basic like occurrence record of a specimen. For what we're doing in the changes project, at least, um, we have not even started talking about Darwin Core because we're we, we have more variables that we need to collect. So we're focusing on getting the data fit for um, basically data science. Um, there's just a bunch of parameters like um, that Darwin Core is not set up to translate. So the way we're thinking about it is that we're gonna come up with our own kind of data model for the analysis that we need to do and then crosswalk some of that to Darwin Core later if we get to the point where we, you know, we're sharing that data. Um, in the Migrating Research Data Collections project, um, in talking with collections managers about like their local natural history, you know, like the, the local catalogs, um, most of them can crosswalk to Darwin Core easily, but that's not the whole sum of what they need to capture about their collections. So Darwin Core is really about sharing select information for, for select purposes. Um, there are databases like Specify, and I didn't talk about these a lot, but and if there are folks here from Specify or Arctos or any of like the awesome, the, there's there's some fantastic projects building like these infrastructures for local databases. Um, they have very elaborate, um, detailed schemas that um, are stand kind of a de facto standard in some ways um, because so many people are using Specify. Um, and there, are, I do believe that there are crosswalks between those databases, but often they just publish to Darwin Core, which is just like a subset of that information, so. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have a question here from Ying Ying Han. Uh, she says, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Can you elaborate a bit more on the community-driven information system that you mentioned in the slide? Yeah, so um, that would be something like Specify. So um, Specify is a database that um, that was developed. I, um, folks at Kansas, I, I'm not going to get the acronym right, but it's like the Kansas University Biodiversity Institute, I want to say, but I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, but that was funded probably 20 years ago at this point and has become, um, in, in, and um, I'm going to give an inaccurate portrayal of this, but um, while it was started by a grant funding and just folks at Kansas, it has now become much more of a community project. So Specify reaches out to folks in the, the Natural History Museum community 
and um, response to you know um, user feedback on how to change the, the database over time. Um, Specify is now being managed by a consortium um, of which University of Michigan is a major member. Um, and so I think going forward, they wanna continue with this sort of like community development sort of um, process where they, they seek feedback from their users. I believe they, that now also they're hoping that, that because they're, they can't stay grant funded forever, it means um, people are gonna have to start buying in or they're hoping that people will buy into the consortium um, and then it becomes a community maintained sort of project. That's the one I know the most about. I don't know as much about Arctos, unfortunately, um, or there might be other ones as well. Great, thank you. Um, so I had a couple questions kind of about Zooniverse and the, the um, kind of crowdsourcing aspect of your projects. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of combine a couple questions here. <laughs> uh, one from uh, Nathaniel Davis and Matt Wheeler. Uh, so asking kind of, do say people from Fisher, or do people from other backgrounds contribute at all to these projects? Uh, you know, someone working in a fishery might have a really different point of view um, on them. And then also, do you, um, how do you think, uh, what do you think about getting students involved in this kind of work? Uh, what do you think is the best way for students to volunteer with data entry and reconciliation? Do you think there's a sort of requisite age or base knowledge? Um, so uh, Nathaniel Davis here works with high school uh, students, for example, and is this something that you think they could and should participate in? Yeah, um, I highly encourage you to check out Zooniverse because um, the, the, so the reason we set up like those tutorials is so that anyone with, you know, like relatively little knowledge of their domain can contribute to these. And that's why they're really fun. Um, and that's also been the idea of like trying to call it community science as opposed to citizen science, because um, trying to like prioritize that it is outreach and prioritize the interaction with volunteers. Um, so one, um, so yes, basically anyone with any kind of background can contribute to these. I think it would be great for high schoolers, albeit a little bit tedious potentially, because it really is a lot of like typing and data entry, but some people get really into it. So in the Angling for Data project, um, one of the top collab, uh, co um, contributors is actually Karen Aloff's mom. Um, who, which is, which I love and, um, just cause she got really into it. And, um, and, uh, there's lots of folks that find it really, really fun. And, um, and I get that. I think looking at the cards is really interesting. Sometimes there's really fun or quirky notes that you find in them. So it, it really is meant to be accessible to, to anybody. Um, one thing that I want to do with my students and granted they're grad level students, but, um, I want to, in my digital curation class, I want to make them make a workflow. And that could even, um, I think that could even be a, a good project for a high school student to a degree, um, because it gets you thinking about like, how do you, um, how do you build a system? How do you, how do you iterate over something? You know, how do you plan for things to be efficient? So it could be a, um, a fun hands-on sort of activity. Um, you can just mess around with Zooniverse workflows without publishing them too. So I think that's perfectly acceptable. So it could be a great thing for a class project. Great. Uh, okay, I've, I think we have one minute, so I'll do one more question here. Uh, this is from Deborah Paul, who also says Taxon Works is in the house. So uh, <laughs> she asks, how much are you hearing now about the evolving use and potential use of Wikidata to share common data across the museum world, for example, people data. I I was just at the Earth Science Information Partners meeting, and there was a whole session on using Wikidata in those contexts. I have not, uh, and um, I think it's new and emerging, and I'm I think there's a lot of potential there, but I haven't quite I haven't gotten there yet. Um, it's something that I'm really interested in exploring, and you should send me an email if you want to talk about that more, because <laughs> I think there could be a lot of potential there. Um, I, I think it could be an interesting way to link across databases as like an additional layer beyond like GBIF and these more formal aggregators. Great, okay, well, so we're at the hour here. Thank you everyone for uh, attending and these great questions. Let's give another uh, round of thanks and applause for Dr. Andrea Thomer. Uh, we uh, look forward to hearing more about this work in the future. And um, we, our next DCMI webinar will be uh, 
um, in March with Dr. Sandy Littletree talking about Indigenous Knowledge Organization. Uh, so we'll be getting information out about that soon, I hope. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, please reach out to Andrea if you have more um, ideas or suggestions or would like to collaborate, I'm sure. Uh, so, uh, and everyone have a great day. Thank you all. Um, the recording will be available, uh, I think, to participants. Sorry to cut you off, Aminta. Uh, there will be a, a recording available. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Andrea Thomer for presenting this very interesting webinar. I also want to thank Dr. Karen Wickett for moderating the session. I want to remind attendees that one of your many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all webinars. A recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be posted to the ACES website by tomorrow and will be available to all ACES members and paid registrants. Within 24 hours, attendees will receive an email with a recording of the webinar and a survey. I encourage you to complete it within seven days. Again, I'm Aminta Dawson with ACES staff, and I thank you for attending today's webinar. This concludes the session.